Now, we are starting a brand new sermon series. Uh, at Roots Fellowship, there's various ways that we walk through the scriptures. Uh, there's one way, w- what is known as expository preaching, which basically means we take a book and we go line by line, verse by verse, and just unpack it. We don't avoid anything. Sometimes there's difficult topics, and we'll engage those topics, right? So that's one way that we make our way through the scriptures. We've just done that by walking through the book of Ephesians. But every now and then, we'll pick up on a topical theme, right? Uh, a theme that w- doesn't land us particularly in one passage. We jump around the scriptures because there's, there's a point that we're trying to communicate, and we're saying that the scriptures affirm this. And so that's what we're about to jump into. Uh, this sermon series is going to be titled, The Resurrected Life. The Resurrected Life. We've just come out of Easter. The tomb is empty. Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding, which is a fancy English word, which means he's praying for us. He's praying for you by name and by situation. And one of his prayers is that you would live in light of the resurrection. That you would have a resurrected life. Because that will change everything. Friends, the, the world, society, culture, your family, your friends... Everybody wants to sell us the good life. They, they want you to live the good life. But here's what the Bible tells us. That anything that is not surrendered under the lordship of Jesus will always pale in comparison to what God has in store for you. And many of us, many of us are living average lives. Your marriage is average. Your work life is average. You think it's fantastic, but in light of what God can do through you, average. And so my hope is that as we make our way through this sermon series, you're going to learn a ton of things. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be convicted. But if you surrender it all to Jesus, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, your life will radically change. It will radically change change. It'll look different to society. It'll look different to what people say life is on Instagram. It'll look different. But you will find so much joy and so much peace. A peace that transcends all understanding. The resurrected life. And so this morning, we're going to look at a passage in the book of Philippians. This is a book written by Paul the Apostle. He's writing to a group of churches in the Philippi area. And, uh, and we're going to, there's a verse in there that's going to kind of serve as our anchor verse for our sermon series. We're going to keep coming back to this verse, reminding us of what it is that God is calling us to, the resurrected life. But I'm going to read a few verses just to give context to what's going on. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many people. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are old words. They are ancient words, but they are not dead words. They are very much alive. And so God, I pray that you would stir in us a passion for your name. For some people, it's literally taking dead hearts and making them alive. For others, it's maybe we have just wandered away from you. God, I pray that we would experience you this morning. Would you meet all of us where we are? I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. He lies. He's the father of lies, constantly whispering in our ears things that are not true. Holy Spirit, would you protect us from him? God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, if you have a Bible, you can meet me there, but I'm just going to read it to you from verse 1. Paul writes, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. 
Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Here's our verse. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Now this long paragraph that makes up Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 to 11 pulses with passion from beginning to end. It begins with Paul's heated and direct words of warning. He says, watch out for the dogs, watch out for the evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's, be on guard, stay alert, because there are those who, who come up and say, this, this is what the Lord wants for you, but the reality is that they're only filling their own pockets. Watch out for them. They're going to tell you that, no, you, you need to do a bunch of works to gain salvation. Watch out for them. Paul tells the church to watch out. Then Paul lists his seven earthly superiorities that made him, according to the law, righteous and blameless, but only to reject them by comparing them to dung. Paul uses strong language here. If you've ever wondered if, hey, does, does the Bible have strong language? Yes, it does. These are R-rated words. The, the Greek word here for dung is skubalon. Skubalon. Which means an, an animal or human excrete, excrement. Like, like he, th these are strong words. He, he says, guys, I've got reason to boast but when I compare them to Christ, your, your PhD, your investment account, your innovative ideas, guys, I'm not saying those things are bad things, but, but when you say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them on par with Christ, Paul goes, it, it, it's revolting. It's got the stench. That, that God, just, he hates that. And so we need to be careful. Because, I mean, this, I say it often, this church is filled with highly competent, highly educated people. You guys are amazing at what you do. You are. Gifted. But be careful that you don't elevate that gift over the gift giver. Because it does not please the Father. He cannot stand for it. The paragraph ends with Paul's explosive words. Verse 10, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, Paul says, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Paul passionately declares that the resurrected life is the life of true righteousness. Righteousness. It is the only good life. In fact, it's the only life worth living. It's the only life worth living. But, but let's take a look at these words. Paul starts by saying he wants to know Christ. My goal is to know him. Now, it's been about 30 years since his personal and powerful encounter with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Paul's been a Christian now for about 30 years. 
And yet here we still find him writing these words, my goal, my goal. This, the, these words express a longing heart to know Christ. To continue to know him. An ambition, a purpose, a target, an objective. He's going, man, I, that's all I want to do is know him. See, to know Christ was the overarching and unfolding ambition of Paul's life. A longing for an ever-deepening, ever-widening personal knowledge of the Son of God. Now, now here's the question. How, how do you get to know someone? How do you get to know someone? You spend time with that person. It's intentional. It's intentional. You spend time with that person. And, and, and some of us will go, but how, how, on a how do, do I get to know Jesus his word. Everything we need to know about Jesus is found in his word. It reveals who he is. And still, and still, so many of us are going, I don't know how I can get into a relationship with Jesus. I don't know how I can know more of him. I find it difficult to know. It's difficult to remember. Let me, let me do this real quick. Sing with me if you know these words. Oh, What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love? We all know it. So, so, so there's no reason for you to say, well, I just, I, I struggle. I, how come you know that song? All of you sang it. Maybe what you need to do is put on some music while you read the word. Maybe that'll help you. There is no excuse for us to not know him, to not have the same ambition and passion that Paul has. Paul goes, you want to sing that song? That's great. Here, I'm going to sing God's words. They burn within me. That if you cut me, I bleed the very word of God. Friends, that, that should be our passion, our longing, our goal. It's this passion that energized Paul's devotion. It's this passion that, that sent him on this epic mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Guys, I can stir you for a little bit. I can. I can get you excited. We can put on some music, get a smoke machine, it'll be great. But, but, but I, 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 can't, I can't create in you this, this lifelong yearning to know him. You have to sit under his word, under his teaching. Paul's longing has set the example for the church for more than 2,000 years. If you have anything of the same desire, hear me, friends. My hope is that this would be your daily prayer. You wake up every morning and you say, my goal is to know you, Lord. Before I, I jump over to my phone and check my Instagram feed, before I jump to the news and see what's going on around the world, before I jump on my app and try to figure out, man, has my investments gone up? What's going on? Before you do any of that, you go, my, my goal is to know you, Lord. More and more and more. Because separated from you, my life is worthless. To know him. To know him. And, and I think, you know, I think the church, we've, we've taken the easier route. L let me explain what I mean by that. Is, is I think too often we fall into the trap of assuming that because someone knows a lot about whatever it is that they do at work, because someone knows a lot about what they study at varsity, because someone knows more about the stats of this team and, 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 and that investment portfolio, then we go, okay, great. Then that is the qualification for a leader in the church. Just because you're a CEO or a director at your place of work does not mean that you are qualified to be a leader in the local church. It was ordinary people who changed the world. 
And what we've done is we've created these human metrics, these, these earthly metrics of like, well, here's what it is. Friends, and they are helpful. I'm not, bash, I'm not saying we need to throw them out the window. No, 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 no. I'm just saying we need to put them in their correct place under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because you can be an amazing director, but then the question is, do you give faithfully? Do you serve? Are you plugged into community? It's just exposing your immaturity and the fact that you, you don't know Christ as you ought to. Let us not fall into that trap, but let us be a people who are on fire for the Lord, regardless of your background, your circumstances, how much money you have, where you come from. I know Christ. My ambition, my desire is to know him. But then Paul goes on and he says that we are to know his power and his fellowship. His power and his fellowship. Paul then breaks down his desire to know Christ into two closely linked expressions that form a single dynamic thought. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And these two principles, power and fellowship, they mutually explain each other. Let me unpack this. His power. And not just any power, but the power of the resurrection. That's what he's talking about here. The power of the resurrection. 2,000 years ago, on the first day of the week, Christ's cold body lay on chilled stone in the arms of death. His heart was stilled in the icy grip of the grave. Whatever blood remained was clotted in his veins. His eyes were fixed and dilated, and his body was bound tightly with spices and grave clothes. But then, oh, but these are shouting words, but then, but then before dawn, his empty eyes blinked open and surged with light, focused and magnificent life. And with ease of authority, his body left the linen wrappings like an empty cocoon. The resurrection happened. The resurrection happened. Death could not hold him down. Sin defeated. Satan declared a loser. Friends, we've got to use these words when we're fighting sin. When temptation stirs and you're going, should I, should I, I know this is wrong. No, 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 you declare. Because it is finished, we can say it is written. I am no longer a slave to sin. I'm a child of God. An heir of the kingdom, co with Christ. Death could not hold him down. Sin defeated. And we need to learn to say this, friends. Satan is a loser. He's a loser. The resurrection happened. The power of his resurrection. And this is God's power. His life-giving power that he demonstrated in raising Christ from the dead. It's the same power that God uses to bring salvation to a dead life. It's the same power that transforms the ever-growing new life of a Christian. I love these words. I wasn't going to read this passage because it's so long, but no. I'm going to read it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. It says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. That's you and me, friends. We need to learn to read ourselves here. Not my next door neighbor. Not my colleague who irritates me. No, you. You were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God. But God. Guys, these, these words, should, they, should, they should never become common to us. And they, and they have... 
Let's be real. They have. Oh, now I know that passage. You know, I've heard it before. We've just done Ephesians. You just read it to us. Are you going to really say it again? Yes. Because the way that you live reveals the fact that you actually don't believe this. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. You know what this passage is saying? Yes, I understand that right now we are here on Cecilia Road at New Hope School sitting on these black chairs. It's a little bit nippy. I get that. But your positional standing, if you are in Christ, is with Jesus right now at the right hand of the Father. That is the resurrected life. That is my position. That is my, not, not the corner office. And I know some of y'all are going, on. Oh, no, you're really going hard at this CEO, corner office, investment stuff. Yeah, because that's my struggle too. I'm preaching to myself. But my position is with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That same power lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Friends, I I don't think we tap into the spirit of God as we ought to. I just don't. We've become so conservative, and, and, and again, all those are great words, but, but I just I don't feel like we're tapping into the Spirit of God that, who is working in us. Paul experienced this power when he was transformed from his self-righteous way of life to become a humble follower of Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 19 to 20 says, Praise. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. He's saying that that power is in you. It's in us. Rooted fellowship, that power lives in us. But do we believe? Do we believe? See, as we look at Paul's life, There is no doubt that Paul lived with resurrection power. You can't doubt it. Was he perfect? No. But he would always find himself close to Christ and saying, I want to know you. I want to know the power of your resurrection. Because where I'm going, there's going to be challenges. It's going to be difficult. It's warfare out there. But I am walking in the power of the resurrection that raised Jesus from the grave. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. You cannot separate the two. So we who live are always being given over to the death of Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The initial revealing sign of knowing Christ is the power of the resurrection. When people come to faith, it's the power of the resurrection. When you surrendered your life to Jesus, it was the power of the resurrection. It's the power of the resurrection that gives us new life, that gives us resilience, that allows us to be cheerful regardless of our circumstances. It's the power of the resurrection that says, I want to wholeheartedly obey and serve God. Because on my own, I don't want to. I'm like a two-year-old. I don't want to, God. I'm calling you to go share the gospel with your neighbor. I don't want to. I'm calling you to serve the community. I don't want to. It's only when the resurrection power is working in and through me that I go, I want to obey and serve you, God, wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. And so my question to you is, do you long to know him and the power of the resurrection? Do you? We're going to pray here in a moment, but I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourselves. Do you? Does your life put on display the power of the resurrection? Or does your life look like everyone else? 
worried about what's happening politically, economically, scared the whole time, anxious, worried? Or do you go, yeah, I'm feeling all of those things, but I'm stepping into the power of the resurrection. Today, God, I'm stepping into the power of the resurrection. When I show up to work, power of the resurrection. When I show up to class, power of the resurrection. When I show up in my neighborhood, the power of the resurrection. I want people to look at me and go, you don't make sense. And your answer goes, yep, you're right. I don't. It's the power of the resurrection. Can I tell you about Jesus? It's not just the power, but Paul also talks about his fellowship. He also talks about his fellowship. The ESV version puts it this way. And we may share his sufferings. This is part and parcel of the power of the resurrection. They go hand in hand, like Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You, you, can't sep- you know you can't separate those two. But we try. All of us want the crown. We want the glory of Easter Sunday. But we don't want to walk through the pain and suffering of Good Friday. It was one of, of, of Satan's temptations with Jesus. He was like, man, I, I can get you to the crown. You don't have to go through the suffering. Jesus goes, no, 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 no. You will not distract me. You will not distract me. You cannot get to the crown without going through the cross. And, and so many, this is the watch out for the dogs. So many people will try to sell us. No, no, you can get to the crown. You can experience all the blessings. You can have it all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And by the way, that verse is usually out of context. (laughs) Because you don't realize what he said before. He goes, you know what? I've been content with a little, and I've been content with a lot. I know suffering, and I know blessing. But you know what? It's because I came to the cross, laid it all down, so that I might experience the crown. That we may share in his sufferings. Now, look, guys, I'm going to be real with you for a moment. All right, let's be real. There's a lot of things that I want to share with Christ. <laughs> Suffering is not one of them. I want to, man, I will partake with Christ on all things. But when it comes to su- this, it's just one of those passages where I go, man, can we, is there a way to skip to like the, the other ones? But the truth is that the Bible is filled with passages that point to this reality. That for the child of God, you cannot escape this. Let me read you a few. Romans chapter 8 verse 17. It says, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Can't get to the glory without the suffering. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, I love the, the, the word when, not if. Not if. If you're a child of God, it's a when. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. But when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I want to be a person that needs nothing. And just work these verses backwards. Where you get to the point where trouble comes your way, when suffering comes your way, you consider it great joy. Because you recognize what God is doing in and through you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 to 30 says, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. That blows my mind. That for the church, when we suffer, when we are persecuted, when we go through challenging times, it is a privilege. When we do so for, for, the, for the sake of Christ, not, not because we're idiots. There's a difference. Like there's suffering because you're being an idiot. Bashing people with the Bible, showing up as if you're perfect, like you've got everything together, pretending and performing. We are in the struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. 
Paul's, Paul's saying here's one of the ways that we identify with one another. Is that we suffer for the sake of Christ. <laughs> Suffering for Christ is a divine gift. It's a sign of sacred intimacy with Christ. I, I love this picture of Jesus carrying that, that, that massive, massive log on his way to his crucifixion. He'd been beaten. The Bible tells us that he couldn't even, wasn't even recognizable anymore. There were people going, I'm not 100% sure if that's Jesus because he had been so badly beaten. And he's hungry and thirsty. He's been up all night, been questioned, accusation after accusation after accusation. He's now carrying this massive log on his back, on his way to being crucified. It's taking forever. And so the Romans pull out a man from the crowd. His name is Simon. He's from Cyrene, which is modern-day Libya. They pull him out, this African man, and they say, help Jesus carry this thing. It's taking way too long. And so Jesus is now side by side with Simon as they're making their way to the cross. I wonder what they spoke about in that sacred space as Jesus is suffering for the world. He is now side by side with this African man. I, I, I wonder, I, I, like one of my questions would have been, what did you do? How did you get here? Why, why are they punishing you this way? It's like you're an innocent man. I wonder what Jesus said to him. We can only speculate this is not in the Bible, but man, I think in that moment he just starts sharing, hey, here's who I am. I'm the son of God. That for years, for years, God our Father has wanted a relationship with his people, with you. And we tried, we tried, and we tried, and we tried. We sent a king, and we sent prophets. And man, so many sacrifices, and it was just never enough. And so eventually, I had to come. I'm going to lay down my life for you so that you might have a relationship with the Father. And it's an amazing relationship. I know I might look like this, but I love the Father, and I know he loves me, and he loves you. So whatever you do with your life, you surrender it. To the Father. I'm speculating. But I think that's how it went down. Because Simon's life literally changed. In Mark chapter 21, we're told that Simon was in Jerusalem. He was probably there for the Passover. Uh, and he had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. In Romans chapter 16, the name Rufus comes up again. This is Paul where he's commending a bunch of people in the local church in Rome and Rufus's name comes up again. Most theologians say it's the same Rufus in Mark. It's the son of Simon, who is now a leader in the local church in Rome. Paul says, hey, he's giving a shout out to Rufus and Rufus's mother. I think Simon went home and said, guys, I need to tell you about this man named Jesus who suffered and calls us to suffer with him because when we do so, one day we will be glorified with him. Surrender your life to him. And they do. And Simon's family was changed forever. You want to have generational, uh, a generational impact in your family? Today, surrender to Jesus. So many of us, so many of us, we, we come from, from, from a history. And like it's just, it's, it's, it just feels like so much weight that we have to carry because of the sins of those who've gone before us. And we're going, you know what, in the name of Jesus no more. I want to change the game today. I want to create a legacy that's going to be so different that my great, 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 great grandkids, they, they'll never know who I am. But one day when we're in heaven and we're standing before the throne, and my hope is that they would, like, they'll be looking, man, where's, have you guys seen on a, I just, on a confidence, I just want to say thank you so much for changing the game. It's the resurrected life. To suffer with Jesus for the sake of the gospel, this fellowship of his suffering is, is, is such a beautiful thing. The desire to fellowship in Christ's sufferings is joined with the desire to know the power of the resurrection. 
my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul's expression, the power of his resurrection precedes the fellowship of his sufferings. The power of the Christ's resurrection provides the strength and the motivation for suffering. Because I know some of you are sitting here and going, how, how am I going to suffer well? How? The power of the resurrection that enables it. This is why I say you can't separate them. You, you cannot separate them. If you have come to Christ and know the power of his resurrection, you've been raised from the dead. If you're experiencing the ongoing resurrection of new life in Christ, then you can suffer well. It's very possible to suffer well. And so my question to you then is, do you know Christ? Because many of us don't suffer well. We complain over and over and over again. We're no different to the Israelites in the wilderness. And so the question is, do you know Christ then? At some point, we need to ask that question. We need to pause and go, hey man, I just... You're always complaining. Always. And I know this is going to sound like I'm, like I'm offending you, but I, I have to, if I'm going to be faithful to the scriptures, I have to ask you this question. Do you know Christ? Do you really know him? Paul, Paul, Paul ends this way, and I'll close in this way. And, and hear me, friends, we're going to unpack all of this on what it means for our marriage, what it means in our singleness, what it means financially, what it means to build legacy. What, what, what does all of this mean in light of my everyday lives? We're going to spend the next couple of weeks unpacking this. But I need to anchor you, anchor you in this. Paul closes in verse 10. It says, being conformed to his death. But Paul is known for taking liberties with language when he's trying to unpack a beautiful mystery of the gospel. Like, he'll create new words. He'll, he'll break all the rules. He, Paul doesn't care. Right? Paul is that guy. He's like, I just don't care. And this portion of the text is one of those moments where he does that, where he takes liberties. What we see here in the original language is a compound word. I tell you every time you come to Rich Fellowship, you get great theology and great English grammar and all of that stuff. A compound word is where two or more root words are merged to create a new or different word. That's what Paul does here. He goes, I'm just so blown away by this. I'm just going to take two words and put them together. There's a brand new word. In fact, in the original language, this word, you can only find it here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And what he's saying here when he says being conformed to his death is, is Paul saying, I'm continually being transformed. Because I'm living in light of the resurrection, because I'm sharing in his suffering, I am continually being transformed. This process is best understood as a cycle of dying and rising with Christ. And it's found throughout Paul's letters as Paul experiences the power of the resurrection and is strengthened to participate in Christ's sufferings, he is being conformed to his death. Paul's language indicates a process in which personal crosses produce a series of mini resurrections that take Paul even deeper in his personal knowledge of Christ. Let me say that again. Paul's language indicates a process in which personal crosses produce a series of mini resurrections that Paul that take Paul to a deeper place in his personal knowledge of Christ. The bottom line is this that Paul he wants us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That's what he's saying. But when you live in light of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, when you share in his sufferings, then what it means is that you're going to daily take up your cross and follow Christ. That's what happens in every aspect of your life. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 27 speaks of this, but let me read you verse 23. This is Jesus. Then he said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's it. It's that simple. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, daily, and follow me. What Jesus did on the cross was ultimately for our salvation, and that happens once. Once saved, always saved. But as he transforms you, now you've got to constantly be denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him. 
That's what this entire series is about. That's what it means to have the resurrected life. Is that in every situation of your life, you are denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. In every aspect of it. And this will impact your attitude, your behavior. This will impact your work. This will impact how you relate with others. How you think about your future. It impacts everything. I don't have time to look at it, so you can look at it in your own time. But in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, three people seemed willing to follow Jesus. When Jesus questioned them further, it was found that their commitment was half-hearted at best. They failed to count the cost of following him. None of them were willing to take up their cross and be crucified upon it, their own interests, their own desires, their own ambitions. None of them actually wanted to do that. They, like, they probably just wanted the fame, because at this point, Jesus is becoming somewhat famous. They probably wanted the fame, but they didn't really want to follow him. They came up with excuses. Oh, I can't do it. I got to go do this thing. I, I, got, I, I, I just can't. I don't have time. But I love the fact that Jesus doesn't lower the standard. This is what many of us do. When people go, I just, I, I can't do what you're asking. I can't do what the Bible is calling me to ask. Well, let me just, let's lower the standards. Let's lower the bar. What ends up happening is you have a ton of people in the church who actually aren't Christian. And that's on us. Jesus doesn't do that. He just goes, okay, cool. And he keeps on going. So again, I ask you the question, do you know Christ? Are you willing to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him? I'm going to ask the band to come up and we'll close in song. But, but here's the thing. I made mention of this a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to say it again. For many of us, it's, it's really hard to deny ourselves and take up our cross when we're holding on to our idols. I, I use the phrase, it's hard to, to take up our cross when we're holding on to our Isaacs. And I use that intentionally because Isaac was a good thing. In fact, Isaac was a promise from God. That for many of us, we're aware of the bad idols in our lives. Right? We know. We know that pornography is, that's sin. Adultery, that's sin. Greed, that's sin. We know all that stuff. And so for intellectual people like yourselves, we just go, you know what, then, man, he's not talking to me. So, so let's take it a little bit further. What or who is the Isaac in your life? That thing that you've been praying for and then God grants it to you, but now all of a sudden you find yourself holding onto it way tighter and way closer than you should. You cannot take up your cross if you're holding onto your Isaac. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning God is saying to you, I need you to pick up your Isaac and I need you to come, on, come with me on a journey. I want to really see if you'll follow me. You're going to sacrifice this Isaac. And, and that might be a job for you. It might be an income for you. That might be, I, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's, it's that thing that you have not surrendered to Christ. I'll share this real quick story. One of my Isaacs, one of my Isaacs is my children. And because of my past and my history and all of that, like I, there's, there's this sense in me to go, I, I, I really want to protect my children. I want to I wanna provide for them. I, and I, I go on to believe the lie because God has given us these children. Our two beautiful daughters are a gift from God. We prayed for them. And I believe the lie, because he's always in my ear. I believe the lie that God, God doesn't love my kids the way I love my kids. And that is foolish. And I'm not saying that, like, this was intentional on God's part, but I know enough about the Bible to, to say that he allowed it. It was a day that my daughter was sick. I hear my wife yelling from downstairs, and so I make my way down there, and, and our youngest is she's shaking. She's and I grab her, and I, 
I jump in the car. I'm holding her while I'm driving, making it to the hospital as quickly as I can. And there's this prayer that I've learned from someone who I love dearly. It's his way of reminding himself that God gives great gifts, but we worship the gift giver, not the gift. And I'm holding her. I'm saying she's not mine, she's not mine, she's not mine, she's not mine. Because what I'm saying in that moment is that, God, you love her way more than I could ever. You're in control, God. You're her father. And it's by grace that you have given her to me. It was in that moment I realized that I have idolized my children. But there is a fear that lives in me. And fear is a spirit. And the Bible tells us that we have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and power and self-discipline. And so some of you, acknowledging that you're holding on to an Isaac is going to be a scary thing. But hear me. Hear me. When you give it up to God, it'll be the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. Because there is a freedom where you go, it's my God who is seated on his throne, who is fully in control, and who loves me. He loves you. And so we're going to sing in a moment, but as we do so, I want it to be a time of response. I really want you to respond. Don't just sing the words because they're words on a screen. Don't just stand up. and It's not business as usual. Really think for a moment and go, I want to live the resurrected life. I want to live in light of the power of the resurrection. Jesus, I want to share in your sufferings. There's no greater intimacy than that. I want to be continually be transformed. I want to deny myself and take up my cross and follow you daily. But I am holding on to some idols. Jesus died for your guilt. He died for your shame. He died for your sin. And he's saying, come. Come to me with those things. It's the same blood that saves. The same blood that protects and heals and nourishes. And so would you come? Man, you can sit where you are. You can stand where you are. You can kneel where you are. You can come up here. We, we really have dedicated this as a prayer corner to say, I'm, I'm coming. Sometimes the, the, the body needs to lead. Sometimes that, that's what happens. It's like it's just because you're just sitting there and you're like, but what do other people think? Who cares what other people think? What matters is what God thinks. And he's saying to you, I love you. And if you want proof, you look to the cross. I love you. And so, heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, it's your word in Romans that tells us that if anyone confesses that you're Lord, and believes in their heart that God you raised Jesus from the dead they will be saved and so God I pray that you would save people here this morning there are folks in here who, who know they're not a Christian Lord I, I pray that you would soften their hearts and save them that right now in this very moment all they have to say is yes to you that's it that's how simple it is there's no classes that need to be taken there's, there's no forms that need to be filled out a simple yes to an invitation. And so I pray now, Lord, that they would confess with their mouths that you are Lord and believe in their hearts that God, you raised your son Jesus from the dead. And right now in this very moment, they are saved and welcomed into the kingdom of God. Lord, I also pray for those who have been walking with you for a while and we found ourselves wandering in the wilderness 
We've taken our eyes off you. We're so concerned about ourselves and our needs and our interests and our ambitions and our desires when we should be laying those down at the foot of the cross and saying, God, use them for your glory. I pray that right now that there would be just a spirit of confession that will flow through here. I don't know why we're so afraid to confess. God, you already know. You already know the depths of our hearts. You know the sin that we find ourselves running to, the sin that so easily entangles us. It's your blood that sets us free. And it all begins with us saying we want to know you. Our goal is to know you. And whatever place we're in, it's to know you. Whether it's on the mountaintop or in the valley, it's to know you. In good times and in bad times, we want to know you. The power of the resurrection. The fellowship of your suffering. Help us, Father. It's in your beautiful name we pray.